Now, have you read any good books lately? Now, uh, I know some of you are great readers, and some of you, um, you know, we would like to watch it when it comes on, on TV. One of my favorite little books. I mean, look, this tiny, this fits in your back pocket, little bitty book. How, it's not even 100 pages. It's 80, 92 pages. 92 pages, little book. This is one of my favorite, favorite little books. We have given away hundreds of copies of this little bitty book. This will make a great little stocking stuffer. I only have four of them left, so I put a few up here uh, on the steps. So if you want one of these little books, you can come get one after service. Like one way or another, I'm going to get you to kneel down at the altar. If it's to get a little book, we'll do it. Now, I love this little book written by uh, author, pastor, leader, Andy Stanley. So a lot of the, the great wisdoms I want to share today come from a little book. So uh, somebody even shared this book with a famous rapper uh, named Snoop Dogg. So Snoop Dogg is reading the book on a plane. I think that's pretty cool. Rappers are readers too. Um, I think is more impressed that you know Snoop Dogg is a little bit taller than me and he's just squeezed into coach on an airplane there. So I'd love if anyone has a connection with Snoop Dogg. If you know him, just ask him, hey, what'd you think of the book when you, when you read this little book called How Good is Good Enough? There's a lot of debate on Christmas music. And one of the biggest debate is like, is like, when can it start? When can you start singing or listening or playing Christmas music on the radio? That debate's over now, because right, Thanksgiving is past. It's, we are in December. I don't think anyone has a leg to stand on if they say, you can't play Christmas music now. But you are already sick of certain songs, and you've been sick of them for a long time. So I'd love a little bit of just group talk. What is a Christmas song you cannot stand? Grandma? Got run, that, yeah, poor Grandma. She gets run over every year. Samuel, what song? Santa baby. Yeah, if you want to just don't know my son, go sing that to him afterwards. Uh, what else? What else? All it, the Mariah Carey one? Why are you going to hate a Mariah Carey like that? So this is, okay. You notice I can't say it back to you. I have to sing it back to you because it's. Yes, everyone's different version of Oh Holy Night. There's only one, and it's Josh Groban's version is the best, and everyone else cannot. Yes. Yes. Because the boy bands have to make a Christmas album, so everyone has their own. Uh, what else? What else? I know some my wife hates. Oh, okay. Okay. Oh, simply having. <laughs> you have to ask her when we're done. The Paul McCartney. Wah, 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 wah. Okay, get Paul on the keyboard. We will karaoke that song just for you, honey. Because we're simply having a wonderful Christmas. <laughs> I will not get cookies when I go home now. If I, <laughs> Yeah, yeah. Man, even hating the Beatles. I mean, that's what Christmas music does to us. None, none of us have mentioned any of the awesome songs of the hymns. None of us have mentioned, like, you know, the, the beautiful songs, the timeless and true. But there's some of those that just get more annoying as the, as the month goes on. I love Feliz Navidad the first, second, and thrice time I've heard it. But after that, I'm like, Feliz Navidad, no. I'm just, no. It's just, so anybody else you were going to share? Like, I cannot stand this Christmas song. What is it? No, no, I didn't hear you say, yeah. Oh, so no hippopotamuses for Beth Miles for Christmas or any other time. Someone give her a hippopotamus next week. <laughs> That'd be fun. It's good to get to know each other, get to know each other's likes and dislikes. Okay, so here's my song, and there's a lot of them, but this one I always thought was creepy, and then I later found it just confusing. It's creepy because... He sees you when you're sleeping. He knows when you're awake. I'm like, that's creepy. Where is Santa? How does he know so much about And as a little kid, I really thought, like, this is making me a little squeamish, Santa. That's the creepy part. Here's where it gets confusing. 
He knows if you've been bad or good, so be good for goodness sake. And I'm like, hey, hey, Santa, for goodness sake here, I need some specifics. Because if you know who's been bad or good, I want some clarifications on like how good is good enough and, and how bad is to the point where you don't get presents, but you get coal in your stocking. So, so as a little kid, here's some pictures of me as a little kid. You can all stay collectively. Aww, look at that kid. That kid loves Christmas. Man, he's opening his hungry, hungry hippos. And I remember one year specifically, I was so good. You know, I always did what my mama and my daddy told me to do. Whatever mama said, mama said, I did it. Uh, I was always on time. I always used my good manners. And it was the year that I wanted a bike, and I was good, and so on my, like, this is sixth or seventh uh, Christmas for me, uh, I got a bike, I got a blue bike with a banana seat, and, and yes, you could tell who my hero was, because I dressed up like him the first time I rode my bike, Lone Ranger, man, I love the Lone Ranger, so I got my hat, got my mask, got my, yeah, there's still training wheels, this is where it all started, still on my bike, 40 years later, but I got a bike, because I was good, and I knew that I was good. And the little tag on the handlebar said, from Santa. So I'm going, yeah, he has been seeing me. I was good this year. But then the whole thing got confusing when, ding, 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 a neighbor boy came riding down the street, too. His name was Johnny. He was a punk. <laughs> I saw him kick a stray dog once. He always lied in class when we got our report cards. He never got S's or E's on behavior. He always failed or got the U unsatisfactory on behavior. Johnny was naughty. And if he got a bike, too, I was like, Santa, you have some explaining to do. <laughs> Santa, I don't know if you've been watching or how this system works, but if you know who's been bad or good, the system is whack. The system is messed up. And then if you take it like, so remember, this is just a, a young mind going. Like, I was six years old when I trusted Christ. And I knew and I believed that he was the son of God. But I, I was kind of confused about, okay, if I can't figure out the Santa Claus naughty nice list. I don't want to be in limbo there. <laughs> I want to know. I've always had an inquisitive mind. I've been skeptic since I was six and seven years old. So my mind thought, if I can't figure out Santa's naughty nice list, and he's just Santa, what about God? Like, does God have the naughty nice list? And if, if, if it's on a matter of how good is good enough, I've got to ask the question then, does, does it matter if you're good or bad? bad, and if it matters about being good, how good is good enough? So the popular age-old question might sound like this. Do good people go to heaven? Don't jump to the end of the sermon, Kathy. <laughs> Let the tension really hang here for a little bit. Do good people go to heaven? And if we're going to ask that question, we have to follow up with other questions like, well, if good people go to heaven... Well, then why did Christ come down from heaven to earth? And this is, then puts us in a position of it's not so much about what you believe, but it's how you behave. Like you can believe whatever you want, just be good for goodness sake. So you can be a good Muslim, you can be a good Hindu, you can be a good Buddhist, you, can, you could even be a good atheist if we live under this assumption that good people go to heaven. It's one of the oldest and one of the most widely accepted assumptions ever. Do good people go to heaven? So let's run it through a filter a little bit because why is it so why is it so popular? Why is this one of just the uh, the most widely accepted beliefs of all time? And you call it a belief because people are living under it. And we live under it because one reason that we kind of like there's some good things about the good people go to heaven assumption. Number one is, you are good enough if we're falling in the assumption. Any bad people here today, the honest people, people of Reformed theology? Okay, like bad doesn't even begin to describe me. But I've been at some bedsides of, of people that I didn't really know, but they just kind of called. They wanted a pastor to speak to them before they, they passed away, kind of deathbed confessions. And I've heard some of the deathbed confessions from some of the most path 
pathetic people of the world. And I call them pathetic based on their own admonition of what they have done. And so they weren't necessarily confessing things to me, they were just admitting. And at the end of their admissions, they go, but I guess I'm a pretty good person, right? No! <laughs> but even some of the worst of the worst people fall under this assumption of, I'm good and I'm a good person. I'll counsel with some people that are going through some really hard times and, and they'll admit all of their faults, but they, but they always try to find some kind of solace in this assumption I'm good. I'm good. Time magazine did a survey, and the survey asked Americans if you believe in heaven. 90% of Americans said they do believe there is a heaven. Heaven exists. 90% of Americans. Guess what percentage also believe that they are going to that heaven they believe in? 90%! Yes, everyone that believes there is a heaven also believes that they are going there. And if you then kind of press the question going, well, why? Why do you believe that you're going to heaven? And way too often there's just a, oh, <laughs> hadn't thought that much about it. We just kind of live under this assumption, but we don't give a lot of attention to it. So today you have no excuse. We're going to give attention to this assumption. And the number one reason we kind of like it or most people go with it is because they believe that they are good enough. There's a second reason we like the assumption that good people go to heaven. The second reason is it seems fair. Like you just, we grow up in a system of you do well, you get promoted. If you do well in school and you study and you do your work, you get the better grades. You get promoted to the next grade. It seems fair. Same thing at work. If you, if you do well and you've got a good system going on at work, good work is rewarded. It's in life. In all these things, there just seems to be a natural sense of cause and effect. It is fair. It seems fair. That's why we like the good people go to us heaven assumption is because it seems fair. It seems fair universal. One more, I'll give us three reasons here. There's many more, but we could just go with three. Three reasons. The good people go to heaven assumption is very, very motivating. Like, if you want something, like if you want a, a, a better, healthier body, then you know that you've got to do the good things, and there's like a little carrot dangling in front of you, and you take the next best steps to do the next best thing, and it's very motivating to know that Good work is rewarded. If you want a nicer car, you want a bigger house, you want a better job, you got to work, work for it. We are Americans. We love to admit that we have pulled ourselves up by our own bootstraps. We worked for it. So, of course, this would seem like it makes sense in eternity. If there is a good place and a good God and a good heaven, you got to be good and highly motivated to get there. So, here are our three points. But, because I like illustrations to drive it a little bit further home, let's say that the assumption that good people go to heaven is a lot like this, this, this balloon. This balloon represents the good people go to heaven assumption. And so there's many other reasons you could fill this up with, with air and alibis. Um, number one, you're good enough. That's part of our filling our assumptions full. And it seems fair. The assumption that good people go to heaven, it just seems fair. <sighs> so it adds more air to our assumption. And it is very, very motivating. <sighs> so we could go on. There's many more reasons you could think about why this has been so popular, why this has been so widely accepted for so many years. But there's a problem with this assumption. Like, you just kind of have to keep it up all the time. And it bumps into big problems when it comes into contact with the Scriptures. Because the problem with good people go to heaven assumption is the Bible does not support it. Like, all these assumptions, well, good people go to heaven, right? Well, try to make that fit into the Bible. <laughs> it won't 
fit. Then you can go from the Bible, from Genesis in the beginning to the maps in the back after Revelation. You can go all over going, hey, where's the, where's the talk about how the good people get to heaven? And you keep trying to find that in the scriptures and you can't find it anywhere and it just won't fit anywhere. So we go to the scriptures and the scriptures do not support this assumption that good people go to heaven. In fact, it instead says in Romans 3, 20. Come back here, assumptions. Therefore, who? No one. No one will be declared righteous by God's sight in the works of the law. Rather, through the law, we become conscious of our sin. So no one's getting in based on being bad or good for goodness sake. No one will be declared righteous in God's sight by works of the law. But rather, through the law, we become conscious of our sin. So when the assumption that bad people and good people, I said it wrong, when the assumption goes that good people go to heaven, when it comes into contact with the Bible, it pops. Of course, you knew something was going to explode today. Come on. When the assumptions come into contact with the Bible, the Bible always wins, and it will burst your bubble if you're living under that assumption that good people go to heaven. So the Bible doesn't support it. Don't try to make the Bible support it. It just does not fit. Another verse that helps us know this even more is from Galatians 2.21. It says, I do not set aside the grace of God. We should stop first and say, who's I? Who's writing this? It's to the church uh, of Galatian. So it's Paul. Apostle Paul is writing this. If ever there was a good is good enough to get you to heaven, it would be the Apostle Paul, right? He is a zealot. He's the best of the best. He's been trained by the best teachers. If anyone ever could say, hey, I don't know what the scale is, but I'm definitely better than most people. I'm the Apostle Paul, whose name used to be Saul until God got a hold of him and changed his whole life and changed his whole outlook to where he knew that he was a sinner in need of a Savior. So now he says this from Galatians 2.21, I do not set aside the grace of God, for his righteousness could be gained through the law, and Christ died for nothing. So if we're living under the assumption that good people go to heaven, Christ died for nothing. We all just need to be a little better. Just be good or at least be better than the worst of the people and God can sort out the worst of the worst because I guess there's punishment for somebody. So that's where that assumption, when it comes up into Scripture, it just does not fit. All right, number two reason. It's problems with this good people go to heaven assumption. We don't know what is good. Like you get asked, ask, okay, God, is, did, you, did you make us with just some innate sense of knowledge about what is good and what is is bad because haven't there been major wars fought by two opposing people groups who both thought they knew what was good and they're praying to god that god would give them victory over the enemy and both groups think they know what's good and that's just like on a worldwide scale of of people groups that go to war take it closer just in your own home haven't husbands and wives made marriage vows to have and to hold in sickness and in health for better or for worse until death do them part? But they can't agree on some of the simplest aspects of chores at home because each of them have an idea of what is good. And when those ideas come into conflict, there's friction there. So there's a problem with the good people go to heaven assumption is because we can't even agree on what is good. We have different perspectives. Put it this way. In a way that everyone that drives a car will understand. When you drive on the road, there's these signs. They're, they're white and they're a little rectangle. It has a number on it. Speed limit. That means you go that. That's like the you shouldn't go faster than that. But so often we push it just a little bit or maybe a lot of bit. But maybe like you kind of go on with the flow of the traffic. And say it's posted 60 miles an hour, but you're going 65 and someone blows by you going 75 or 80, what do you think in your mind as they go passing fast? I'm following him? Okay. I usually think, I usually, yeah, I, th I usually think, they're the idiot. You idiot. Okay, I am also speeding five miles over. He is speeding, you know, I'm making it a he. It's an assumption. It's a, it's a male. He's speeding faster, so he's the idiot. Like, we can't agree on, well, he's just going by feel. 
So I don't know if you've ever been pulled over for speeding. You try to work this one out with the police officer that's pulled you over. Um, do you know how fast you're going? Yeah, yeah, I know it's posted 60 here, but it just, it kind of feels like an 80 mile per hour day. You know, can we just go by feel today? There's a problem with the assumption. You see, that's so ridiculous when we put it in the analogy of speeding on the highways. It's the same thing as we're going to leverage our eternal destiny based on a feel. Well, it feels like this is right. It feels like this is good. No, there's a problem with the assumption that good people go to heaven is because we don't know what is good. We don't have this internal gauge of goodness. A third reason would be like this. We don't know what grade you have to get. Like how, if, if it's, it, okay, even if we could all agree what is good, how good do you have to be? Like we put this in school terms, like GPA stands for good point average. How many of the good points have to outweigh the bad points? Is it like a 50% deal? Like 51% good over 49% bad and that's good enough? Or does it need to be like 70% good and that's how we got the American grading system? 70 is a pass. All you got to do is pass. We don't know what grade you have to get. And if you, you open the Bible and you just, you go from all the pages and going, I, where does it say what grade you have to get? You can't find it because it's not in there. We don't even know when the grading period starts. How old are you when he starts if, if good people go to heaven, when does it start? When does God start keeping score? Because I'm thinking you get a pass from like your younger years. There's some, there's some, you just don't know any better. And we're really hoping and praying that God doesn't judge our teenage years against us. Because we won't live long enough to make up for the bad we did in our teenage years, many of us. So we don't know what grade we have to get, and we don't know when God starts grading. It would be like this by way of an analogy. Imagine we're all in, um, we're in class together. Let's pick a class. World history. We're all in world history together. And the professor walks in one day and says, all right, class, welcome to world history. There will be one exam. Your grade is dependent on this one exam. One exam, and it's pass-fail. Class dismissed. Wait, 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 wait. <laughs> Some of the more bold ones of you in the class go, hey, well, I got questions. Need some clarifications. Need some specifics here. Um, hey, hey, professor, you got any notes? No notes. Hey, what's going what's gonna to be on the test? I mean, it's world history. Which part? What time period? Which part of the world? You'll figure it out. Hey, teacher, uh, wh what day is the test on? Stinks to be you. Imagine a professor like that. You would drop that class in a heartbeat and you would write a really nasty, scathing letter to hope that that professor would no longer be allowed to teach. But that's how we treat God if we live under the assumption that good people go to heaven because the Bible doesn't support it and he hasn't given us the subject material of what we've got to know and when we're going to be tested on it. So, good people go to heaven. It really, really, really is a hard thing to get our heads around, especially when we use the scripture because we don't know what is good we don't know what grade we have to get. And finally, Jesus disagrees. Jesus disagrees with this assumption. And so like, well, who's Jesus to say? He came from heaven. <laughs> if you want to know what it takes to get there, wouldn't you want to trust the, the experienced, not just opinion, but knowledge of the person who came from where you want to go? So he came from heaven. He created the earth. So if anyone knows how you get to heaven, you would listen to the one that came from there. That's what we celebrate during this Christmas season. God with us. Emmanuel means God with us. So if Jesus disagrees with it, we should pay attention to what Jesus says. In fact, Jesus taught that some of the best of the best, those good rule followers that really felt puffed up by their ability to, at least on a surface level, look better than everyone else around them. Pharisees, scribes, he called them hypocrites. You, hip, you think you're good. You're a whitewashed tomb on the outside, but inside you're full of decaying bones. You hypocrite. You think you're good. I disagree. So Jesus taught that the best of the best weren't making it, and some of the worst of the worst were being 
forgiven. So, Jesus hated the good people go to heaven assumption. So, in fact, Jesus did not teach that good people go to heaven. Jesus did teach that forgiven people go to heaven. Are there any forgiven people in here today? Amen, amen, amen. Because we know that we're not good enough. And if you didn't know that till today, I hope that God teaches it to you strong today so you don't live under this assumption because it will leave you wanting. But this truth that Jesus taught that forgiven people go to heaven, forgiven people go to heaven, this will change the world if the world will listen. Because if you have to be forgiven, we have to ask, well, how do you be forgiven? By way of an analogy, imagine that we all walk together. Field trip, we all walk together to the gates of hell. And we can just peer inside past the, past the iron gates of hell, and we look in there and we see people, and we, we ask the guard at the door, hey, um, are there any Presbyterians in there? And the guard answers, the guard at the gates of hell says, yes, yeah, there's Presbyterians. Don't worry, Presbyterians, I'm going to offend all the denominations. Um, hey, are there any, are there any Catholics? Are there any Baptists? Are there any Methodists in there? And again, the answer comes back, yes, 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 each time. But then imagine that we were immediately transported from the gates of hell to the gates of heaven, and we ask the same question. We ask if St. Peter's, if he's really at the gates. We ask him, hey, um, there any, there any Episcopalians in there? Any Baptists, Methodists, Lutherans? Got any Catholics in there? And the answer would be no. Like, no? Well, then who's inside? And the answer comes back, only forgiven people are in there. The forgiven people who have put their faith in the one who forgives, who even from the cross, his very own cross, Jesus Christ, with his arms stretched out and nailed in that position, he points a, a statement up into heaven, a request, if you will, and he says, Father, forgive them, for they know not what they do. Forgiven people get to have this right relationship with God. And so we see this most clearly from the cross. There's, there's two criminals on each side of Jesus. And I say criminals because to call them thieves puts it too lightly. Thieves don't get executed. Thieves don't get the death sentence. Thieves might get a hand chopped off, or they might have to work off their debt in prison. Criminals worthy of death were put on the crosses. So what was Christ's crime? Because he was perfect. He wasn't just good. He was perfect perfect and that perfection he's he's turning over the assumption that good people go to heaven and so those supposedly so-called good people want jesus gone and so as as he is crucified we see what one of the criminals says to jesus one of the criminals says to jesus remember me when you enter into your kingdom and Jesus responds to him, Today you will be with me in paradise. And the beauty in that statement is it, to me this is, like the, this is like the most definitive proof that good people go to heaven assumption is just absolutely wrong. Because if good people go to heaven and this guy was bad enough to die on a cross, can you just make a last minute plea and get in? Okay, Jesus, <laughs> I know we're about to die here, but from here on out, it's a straight and narrow for me. No more bad stuff, no more criminal activity. I'm going to be good, Jesus, for the hours or minutes that I have left on earth. And Jesus tells him, too bad, so sad, it's too late to say sorry. He doesn't say that, does he? Now his words to us speak incredible encouragement to all of us. He says, truly. And it's so good when Jesus says truly, because he cannot tell a lie. He only ever speaks truth. He's the father of truth. 
going against the father of lies, and Satan would love for us to believe the lie that good people go to heaven, so just be good to leave everybody alone. Just don't hurt nobody. Believe what you want to believe. Just behave good enough. Jesus says, no, truly I tell you today you will be with me. Be with me. And from the being with him, we take this incredible encouragement. Because everything in every other religion and everything in the assumption that good people go to heaven, it rests in two letters. D-O. Just do The thief on the cross, the criminal on the cross, couldn't do anything other than die. He has no good deeds left to do from there. And so when we live under this assumption of, I just got to do better, do better, do better, do better than I did last year, hopefully next year will be better than last year, do better, do good, and hopefully when I come to the end of my life, I've had enough doing good that God will see that and be pleased because he sees me when I'm sleeping and he knows when I'm awake. He knows if I've been bad or good, so I better be doing more good for goodness sake. And every other world religion other than Christianity lives, actually just dies because it has no life in it. It dies under this battle cry, do! And if you live under this terrible assumption of just go, do! Well, then you are in deep, Do! What if it had two more letters to add to this that would make it true? What if it's what Christ has done? Remember from the cross, Jesus Christ shouts up to heaven and for all to hear, it is finished. Christ's work on the cross was what was done for us. And from that then, then we go forward to do good works, not in order to gain Christ's approval, but from his approval. I want to close with this verse from Ephesians. Apostle Paul writes again, to God saved you by his grace when you believed. And you can't take credit for this. It's a gift from God. I love this gift-giving season because you can tell during Christmas when they give you a gift, you can tell who really knows you, who knows your preferences, who knows what you need who gives you the gift that you didn't even ask for or know that you wanted that, but it was a perfect gift. And you feel so loved because it's that that thoughtfulness that they know you and they love you. That's just Christmas gifts. How much more from God when he goes, oh, I know the gift you need. The gift you need is grace. And so God supplies that grace. The verse goes on, for salvation is not a reward for the good things we have done so that none of us can boast about it. And for we are God's masterpiece. And he has created us anew in Christ Jesus so that we can, now we can do the good things he planned for us long ago. So we don't do the good things to try to get on God's good side. We do the things because Christ is in us and he is good. Let's pray together, church. Father, thank you that you love us enough to give us Jesus. Thank you that you've given us minds so that when you give us the command to love you with all of our heart, with all of our soul, with all of our mind, let our our mind not be misled by the, the wayward assumptions of the world that doesn't know you. We have your word, so we can know your will. We can know that your will for us is to be a part of this incredible kingdom work that you're doing. We will love you and love each other We'll make disciples. We do this from the position of forgiven sinners that trust in the work that Christ has done on the cross for us. In Christ's name we pray, in Jesus' name.